Thank you, Austin. Good morning. Um, I'm calling to order public meeting number 291 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission today, um, held on Thursday, March 12th, 2020 at 10 a.m. in our offices here at 101 Federal Street in Boston. Today, consistent with our regular practice, our meeting will be live streamed. While members of the public are, are still welcome to attend in person, we have strongly recommended remote attendance. In addition, external meeting participants will today participate remotely via the phone. Um, we're imagining the technology will be all set and we just invite the public to um, appreciate a little patience as we connect our external speakers by phone. In the last several days, we have seen the expanding global and local impact of the coronavirus. I want to commend our internal team here for all the efforts these past weeks, assessing and fact gathering to inform our policies and practices under these challenging, changing circumstances. The entire team here at the Gaming Commission has worked collaboratively to ensure we, as public servants, continue to do our jobs in this dynamic environment. We have, of course, emphasized that health and safety is our priority. I thank all of you, the employees at the Gaming Commission, for taking individual responsibility to practice all recommended hygiene practices and, and I appreciate continued vigilance, excuse me. Our leadership team also has been in regular consultation with our licensees other key external stakeholders, and of course, state officials for proper planning and preparedness. You have already learned of practical steps <clears throat> here that you've taken for your individual safety. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, and yes, that includes, as we said, um, hand washing and surface cleansing, but we also have been working with our licensees to make sure that they too are vigilant, and we appreciate Encore Boston Harbors uh, the MGM Springfield and Plain Ridge Park Casino's continued cooperation and transparency. The format of this meeting is aligned with the governor's emergency declaration at the end of the day on Tuesday that he issued and the related issuance of the executive department uh, uh, coronavirus advisory, which you'll learn more of from um, interim executive director Wells. As played out in the news hourly, it is clear that our guidance regarding how to address uh, the spread of the coronavirus must be nimble. Indeed, last night we saw our president address the nation to explain new restrictions on European travel, among other items. And in addition, we have heard yesterday that the NBA has suspended its season. Our interim exec executive director will provide more detailed up to date on all of our preparations. However, my message today is that the commission and its staff stand ready to adapt to changing circumstances as the state and the nation consider how to most effectively deal with the many difficult challenges involving the spread of the coronavirus. Both staff and the commission will be prepared to implement further guidance that may be issued at these levels. While we will continue to pay careful attention to any new developments, we want to stress some very important items of advice right now that our public health partners are prioritizing. Public health officials continue to urge a series of precautionary measures as it relates again to reducing and preventing the spread internally by exercising increased hygiene and sanitization. We are working closely with our building here to make sure that those efforts are prioritized. Furthermore, the CDC has issued specific guidance about high-risk individuals and large gatherings. Specifically, older adults and people who have severe underlying chronic medical conditions like heart or lung disease or diabetes seem to be at higher risk for developing more serious complications from 
this illness. People who are at higher risk are encouraged to avoid crowds as much as possible. As I indicated, you will now hear more details from Karen Wells, our Interim Executive Director, who will emphasize that we are staying aligned with the guidance from the Governor, the Department of Public Health, and the CDC. This will be the first time all of us as a commission have been together, and I expect questions. We are looking forward to your report, Interim Director Wells, and in light of that, I ask that we suspend item number two on our agenda and that we turn to instead item nine, uh, number three, and then we'll uh, go back to the minutes after the conclusion of your report. Thank you, and again, a big thank you to all of the MGC team members. You've been working hard, not only on this very, very important matter, but your day-to-day -day operations. And uh, all of us, I know, have been watching that, and we appreciate all of your vigilance and your diligence and your commitment. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Morning, so morning. at this time, as for, as, uh, for the general update, item 3A on the, the agenda, I'd just like to update the Commission on the Mass Gaming Commission preparedness issues related to the coronavirus. As such, I'd like to also move item 3D and incorporate that as part of item 3A uh, because that involves part of our preparedness plan. Just like every other state agency in the Commonwealth, we are monitoring potential impacts of the coronavirus to our operations, and we're coordinating with the subject matter experts at the Department of Public Health as they focus on the health and well-being of the Commonwealth. To keep people informed of the situation as this continues to evolve, we have now mobilized a new web page, massgaming.com backslash COVID-19. I'd like to commend Elaine Driscoll, our communications director, for setting that up so quickly. Some points that are noted um, as part of the new web page. As information related to the coronavirus continues to rapidly evolve, MGC will use the dedicated web page to provide commission-related updates and advisories. So that is an excellent resource not only for our staff but also the public. Also, I want to highlight that the MGC is engaged with frequent, in frequent communications with gaming licensees and state officials to share information, monitor developments, and determine appropriate next steps. This is a collaborative effort. Individuals are encouraged to routinely review the Department of Public Health and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention websites for regular updates. This website will also be updated as appropriate. So I encourage folks on our staff and the public to routinely check to see if there's any new information posted on the website. Including on, included on that website is the following statement from the Mass Gaming Commission. The MGC is proactively engaged in frequent discussions with gaming licensees focused on prior, prioritizing the health, safety, and well-being of casino guests employees, and regulators. Like many organizations, we are closely monitoring developments from the CDC and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Our licensees are employing enhanced sanitation procedures and other precautionary measures while we maintain a constant dialogue with the casinos and other stakeholders sharing collective updates to inform appropriate next steps. So as to item 3D on the agenda, which I'd like to incorporate as I discuss some of our preparedness measures, on Tuesday, March 10th, Assistant Secretary and Chief Human Resources Officer for the State Human Resources Division issued a coronavirus advisory to executive branch employees. That memo is included in your packet. I am recommending that the Commission formally adopt the precautionary measures outlined by the Governor's Office. Included in that guidance is the following. One, all work-related travel, both foreign and domestic, is to be discontinued until further notice. Staff with outstanding travel commitments or concerns about handling, pardon me, canceling scheduled travel should bring such concerns to the attention of their agency head. We also strongly encourage that you avoid any personal international travel. Two, conferences, seminars, and other discretionary gatherings 
scheduled and hosted by executive branch agencies involving external parties are to be held virtually or canceled. Regular internal business shall continue, including but not limited to mandated public hearings and board meetings. Meetings organizers are encouraged to utilize alternatives like conference calls, WebEx, and other communica group communication tools. <clears throat> Additionally, employees should not attend external work-related conferences, oh, pardon me, so number three. Additionally, employees should not attend external work-related conferences, seminars, or events. Alternatively, employees are encouraged to participate remotely. And number four, as previously communicated, employees feeling sick with fever or flu symptoms should not come into work. Information available to date regarding COVID-19 indicates that the highest risk population includes older adults and individuals with serious chronic medical conditions. Employees in this risk group are encouraged to talk with their supervisors to review possible alternative work assignments. And the governor indicated each of the above measures will be revisited, revisited in 30 days or sooner as circumstances dictate. So you have the entire memorandum from Jeff McHugh, that Assistant Secretary and Chief Human Resources Officer. So at this time, as far as agency operations, my request is that the Commission uh, adopt the Governor's measures as policy for the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Well, I certainly agree with that recommendation. It's a well thought out memo, I've had a chance to look, and um, I, I would agree with that assessment that we adopt those. Uh, uh, those recommendations. Before we uh, have further action on your motion, I just, my apologies. Before we have any action on that motion, I want to make sure that there are any particular questions on this item for uh, um, uh, Karen on the particular motion. Okay. No. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. And thank you. Thank you. Now, I also want to advise you that the situation may change in the coming days or weeks and that the governor may offer further directives or guidance. My recommendation for this agency is that Mass Gaming Commission staff presumptively follow any additional directives from the governor and that we remain flexible in setting up further communication, further communication and further commission meetings to address any changing circumstances. That may mean more frequent meetings or meetings utilizing accommodating formats. So just to put it out there uh, for the commission and then the public, this, this is uh, a fast moving and evolving situation and we need to be flexible and nimble in how we deal with it. So there may be additional meetings, we may do some other formats using some technology, uh, but you should be aware. And that my expectation is there may be more directives from the governor and that uh, we will bring those to you in, in the public commission meetings but until we get to that point, presumptively, we would follow along with the commission. That's, that's my expectation. Unless there's any comment, to the, fir comment to, to the contrary. That would be, I think, how we would operate. We would just get the information to the full commission as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I would think so. And I would also think that Interim Executive Director Wells would be empowered to do any sort of announcements in that regard pending any necessary commission meeting between today's date and anything that may come up? Uh, I do know it is a priority under the directive that public meetings continue to be held and the board meetings continue to be held. Uh, the governor did address that precisely in his guidance. We will be able to be very nimble and convening and uh, to that end, um, we will use all tools available to make sure that we're, we're um, giving the proper uh, guidance for the entire com uh, uh, operations and executive staff. I'm just envisioning if something happens before the next convening, whether something becomes more restrained and, and we do run into a problem calling a meeting. Well, I, and again, I think that what I want to assure everyone here is that we are going to be able to work together to convene meetings to assist as a commission, as a public body. Um, I'm and, just talking about in, in other circumstances, we've just made sure the executive director can sort of do it in the interim to make clarity, and then we right. deal with it when we convene again. Yeah, I, I agree. I think public safety is paramount, our employees and those that, um, that we regulate, and um, so following those guidelines will be essential, and of course we will 
make ourselves available um, very quickly, but I do agree that right. in the interim, something comes out at 8 o'clock at night, our executive director has the ability to um, maybe send an email and advise folks of a new, uh, new policy or a new recommendation, and then we will follow suit as quickly as possible. Is there anything further on that? Any other comments for me? Okay. At this point, I'd like to advise the Commission on uh, MGC operational planning, policy, and prevention. The MGC is making every effort to maintain a safe and healthy work environment while closely following guidance issued by federal, state, and public health officials. Uh, an internal departmental team has been convened and is actively engaged in monitoring the rapidly evolving situation, assessing risk, and identifying implementation needs. The team has also been tasked with developing contingency readiness, operational redundancy, and overall preparedness planning. The MGC has instituted a series of precautionary measures, including enhanced sanitization, sanitization. And the MGC has enhanced cleaning and sanitization procedures for the Boston office and the MGC offices and GameSense info centers located at each casino property including heightened disinfectant protocols for high touch point areas and the increased availability of hand sanitizer and other cleaning supplies. Travel restrictions. As you just ratified, in keeping with guidance, the guidance from provided by the Massachusetts Human Resources Division, HRD, all work-related travel, both foreign and domestic, is discontinued until further notice. Preparedness for increased tele telework or remote work. The MGC Information Technology Division, ITS, is working to ensure our agency is able to access many, if not all, of its systems remotely. Employees have received updated instructions and training on remote access capabilities, including remote collaborative technology. Wellness policy and workers at high risk. Employees feeling sick with fever or flu symptoms are required to stay home from work. According to the HRD, information indicates that the highest risk population includes older adults and individuals with serious, serious chronic medical conditions. Employees in this risk group have been encouraged to talk with their supervisors to review possible alternative work assignments to reduce their exposure to others or the chances of being infected. I also would like to address public meeting modifications, as you can see from the, you know, the the phone that we have here today. As the situation continues to rapidly evolve, the MGC will make decisions regarding public meetings on a case-by-case -case basis. The MGC has a well-established live stream system allowing for convenient remote access. External parties will participate remotely by call-in. The Commission continues to ma maintain a robust online meeting archive that includes convenient access to all meeting materials, transcripts, and videos. And in keeping with guidance issued by Governor Baker and declared in the state of emergency, discretionary gatherings that involve external partners are to be held virtually or canceled. I'd also like to address some casino mitigation and prevention initiatives. Gaming licensees remain in frequent communication with regulators and other government officials sharing updates about precautionary measures, mitigation planning, and contingency preparations, including but not limited to the following. Engagement of independent experts to advise about best practices and strategies during a public health crisis. Enhanced cleaning protocols, including additional hand sanitizer dispensing stations in high traffic areas and free, increased frequent frequency of disinfectant procedures throughout the properties. Enhanced communication to patrons and casino staff about prevention tips and critical health information, including that risk for older adults and those with pre-existing medical conditions. Enhanced communication to workforce about health, wellness, and sick leave policies. Continued monitoring of the guidance provided by federal, state, and public health officials. And I'd also like to re reiterate uh, what Chair Judd Stein had said early, earlier, this important advisory, which we keep reminding you. The CD has issued specific guidance about high-risk individuals and large gatherings, specifically those older adults 
and people who have severe underlying chronic medical conditions, like heart or lung disease or diabetes, they seem to be at higher risk for, de pardon me, for developing more serious complications from the COVID-19 illness. People who at, are at higher risk are encouraged to avoid crowds as much as possible. The casinos have also taken measures on, on their own as far as informing the public. Uh, the Encore Boston Harbor has uh, more information about precautionary me measures on their website. If you look at our link on our website, they will link to that Boston Harbor one as well. And MGM also has, uh, as part of their corporate initiative, they have a corporate website with more information. And to sum up, I'd also like to review some tips and information, because it is really important that we all collectively work together uh, and, and know what the best practices are. And this is the information recommended by the CDC. The best event defense against spreading illness, now that includes seasonal influenza, the common cold, and COVID-19, is to follow some simple preventative guidelines as recommended. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Use hand sanitizer if soap and water are not available. Avoid close contact with others who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are not feeling well. Cover your mouth and nose with a tissue when you cough or sneeze, then throw the tissue in the trash. If you don't have a tissue, cough or sneeze into your upper sleeves, not into your hands and clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces, phones, computer components, door handles, etc. I recognize that this is a time when our employees and the public are very concerned about these public health developments. I would like to thank our staff for their cooperation, collaboration, and their steady work ethic. We are committed to keeping our staff informed with frequent updates and know that nothing is more important than their health and safety. So that concludes my update for you. I don't know if you have any particular questions for me, and we also have uh, our ombudsman, John Ziemba, present, who has been running point with our preparedness operations for this situation. Um, thank you for that uh, update, um, Karen. Just a point of clarification. Um, when the guideline says um, a restriction on the domestic travel, mm -hmm. that is, of course, to be understood as interstate, not necessarily within the state. Correct. So our staff continues to be assigned to the casinos, and they Correct. Uh, go home and go back. Correct. Uh, so for example, I could still travel to MGM Springfield to go do something at MGM Springfield. That is right. not a restriction. Can right. I travel to Las Vegas? Uh, for a meeting or for not. a conference? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Karen, do you want to address some of the uh, practices that are particular to those who are working at the uh, uh, our licensees uh, sites? Right. So obviously we have the boston office here and then we have three remote sites and uh, we are equally concerned about all our employees wherever they work so we have made sure that employees at the sites are um, uh, that they have the required uh, tools for example the hand sanitizer and the wipes so that they disinfect and the uh, for example the gaming agents chief is working with the gaming agents on uh, some revised protocols for what they do to minimize contact and minimize risk. Because we do have some capability through technology with surveillance operations and cameras and things we can do to minimize contact. So their health and safety is critical to us as an agency. So uh, we will continue to monitor the situation, also keep them informed, and also listen to them and see if they have concerns. I do want to emphasize that anyone uh, who has concerns if they have an underlying health condition their age or they live with someone that may have an underlying health condition, encourage them to talk to a supervisor because we want to be able to help people in this situation. We don't want people feeling anxious or upset or concerned. We want to handle this together as a team. So I would just want the, my message to those people is we care about what, you, what you're doing, we care about you as a person, and we want to make sure you're, you're, you're taken care of in your position. 
Um, you you uh, mentioned this briefly, but can you uh, expand a little bit as to whether um, uh, licensees are taking some enhanced? Yes, um, yes, and we uh, we've been in having many many conversations with them on their enhanced procedures. I think one of the most critical. Uh, is that they have engaged these independent experts as, a, as advisors for this. As I assume everyone expects, you know, I am not an expert on disease prevention or disease control, so they have brought in experts to advise on what they should be doing, and we are having them follow the expert advice on what needs to be done given their business plan and what, what their operations are. And that may continue to evolve and change, but the experts are in a better position to understand what they should be doing for public health concerns. Uh, they also have their enhanced cleaning protocols. They are informing us of all they're doing as far as their routine cleaning, and they're also talking to their employees and working with their employees about uh, their situation and what they, what they can do as employers should, uh, should anyone get sick. And today we will be hearing from uh, two of our licensees in their quarterly report. So if you oh, have, point. you yeah. may be able to ask more specific questions. Exactly. Yep. And I, uh, had a conversation with Captain Connors this morning. Uh, Captain Connors this morning regarding uh, Mass Massachusetts State Police has their own product, uh, protocols for dealing with the public and he's already uh, informed all his lieutenants of those protocols and um, procedures for dealing with the public. So I know that's, those efforts are underway too. I think we're as pre prepared as we possibly can be. Uh, um, <clears throat> you may want to just address our GameSense advisors as well. Uh, yes, so we have uh, confirmed with the licensees that they are also uh, going to be, uh, that, that that space is also going to have that enhanced cleaning protocol and then the uh, the head of the game sends Marlene Warner. She is working with them and in connection with uh, the other officials, the state officials, for example, the uh, you know, governor's office and uh, DPH on what needs to be done. So we're all working collaboratively. I think that's the message here is that, yeah, again, none of us is as smart as all of, as all of us. So we need to work together with different um, agencies and with diff the different operators and different members of our staff to figure out, okay, given the situation we've got here, here, what are the right steps that we should be taking and ensure we're taking those steps? Before we move on, are there any further questions on uh, this update? We could always turn back to it if, if you think of something. I would like to take a, um, a short break, if you don't mind, just for a clarification of, of a matter, and then we'll convene to um, a, an operational report that uh, we're looking forward to, if you don't mind, if I could have five minutes. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you for your patience. We've reconvened a meeting uh, <clears throat> number 291 here at the Gaming Commission, and we are now looking forward to an update from um, Derek, your team, if you want to introduce everyone, and it's an update on the promotional gaming meter, which is sub-item 3B. So we're skipping the minutes. Oh, no, I was going to conclude um, Karen's entire piece, and okay. then we'll turn to the minutes. Thank you. Good, ma good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Is that, all, is that on the mic? It is on. I'm just trying You might to want to bring it. it. Rather than hang a place <laughs> all wipe over it. Do you, do you want to just bring it a little closer? Better. Thank you. All right. I'm joined by Priya Gandatra, Douglas O'Donnell, Bruce Band, and Scott Helwig. And we're here to update you on a project we've been working on. Uh, in your packet, you have a summary memorandum, a letter of request from MGM Springfield, and a PowerPoint deck from MGC's Gaming Technology Division. In September of 2019, MGM Springfield requested an alternate meter called the Casual Elect Electronic Promotion In Meter, we'll refer to that as CEPI going forward, be used for promotional play calculations rather than the Casual Promotion Played Meter, um, 
staff of the MGC's Investigations and Enforcement Bureau, the Information Technology Division, and the Finance Division have reviewed the request to make sure it meets the following requirements. One, per 205 CMR 140.02, paragraph 1, subparagraph E, a promotional gaming credit must show one, it was issued by the gaming licensee as a gaming, a promotional gaming credit in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 23K Section 2, and two, it was received as a wager in the gaming licensee's gaming establishment. Second, we look to make sure it did not cause any harmful impacts to the MGC's central monitoring system. And third, we look to make sure that any change that we would recommend would be implemented in a responsible manner. The reason the request came from MGM is laid, laid out, I think, very well and better than I could ever write it in MGM's um, letter to the Commission, which is attached to this correspondence. However, um, for purposes of a presentation, I'll try to simplify it in a quick example. Um, the IGT Advantage system utilized by both MGM Springfield and Encore Boston Harbor requires patrons to insert some of their own money into a slot machine in order to gain access to their free play. So they call this as seating the bet or fronting the bet. Um, once a patron makes a bet with their own money, they're refunded their money by the casino. In order for them to turn into free play, you actually have to make another bet. You have to play that second bet, which is different from most other um, free play systems we see where the second you put your card in, you download your free play credits and you spin, it's a free play. Um, so we took a look at this and we said, hmm, the way that they're actually doing the bet doesn't entitle them to the promotional play that, they are, that our statute and our regulation allows for. So the first thing we said is, now we need to take a look at the cashable um, electronic pr pr promotion in meter. Does that step it right away? And it does, so that meets our needs. Um, so a big piece of it was just understanding what they were talking about, and Priya, and Scott were great at that. They took us out to the machine. They put a bet in. Uh, they put five dollars in. They put on the free on um, the test time. They showed us what meters actually stepped, what didn't step, and then we actually took it out back and ran it through what would happen on a gross gaming revenue calculation piece. And under the old system, the casino was getting taxed on that gross on that free play. Um, under the new meter, they would not get taxed under it. So um, it, was, it was a strange situation. There was no harm to the patron because the patron was getting reimbursed no matter what. It's just the casino wasn't getting credit for the, ta for the free play. Um, so once we kind of realized that, the next thing we did was we turned it over to the IT team and we said, hey, if we allow the um, casino to do this, what are the issues? And the, the IT team came back to us at, with uh, some three things they really wanted us um, to make sure the CMS could do. One, make sure that um, new meter was being captured in our system because it wasn't part of the initial scoping of the project. So are we capturing that in our house system? Um, second, would that meter ever be used for something in the future? Um, because each meter has a specific reason if we allowed people to put debit cards in, if we allowed in the future, which we don't do now, would this have a downstream impact? Um, and the third was how can we develop a plan of implementing this that isn't harmful to our other licensee who is using the ACSC system? So how do we get these new reports and these new fields into our database, which is using one report for the end of day meter calculation to get this resolved? And I can, if you'd like, I can take a break here and if you want to ask questions of Scott and Priya of how they did that, I mean, this was a lot of work that they had to go through for a fairly simple issue that Bruce, Doug, and I had to look at of does it meet our regulation. Then it's how do we make this work? And there's a PowerPoint kind of attached to that where they, came back to us with three options. But I can take a break now if you have any specific technology questions, um, or I can just keep going with the basics and then leave any questions at the end. I'm, I'm thinking of one, uh, and, and maybe yeah. you'll address it uh, uh, collectively later. Um, so uh, was there, back to uh, PPC with its different system, 
Was that a problem um, of taxation uh, of the free play? No, it wasn't a problem. We made sure um, on our, our CMS system that we designed the, um, the update so that it would um, account for the fact that it, uh, PPC is using a different system. So it, it can recognize the differences between the meters com um, coming in so that we know um, if it's an advantage meter, we'll apply this fix so it goes into the right meter. If it's an ACSE, it'll just go wherever it falls normally and it, it'll match up. So um, that's, that's great going forward. I guess that's, that's what you're working on. But I'm thinking about in the past. No. Was, it a, no. was it ever a, a problem for PPC, I'm, I'm wondering? It was not because they don't require the patron to seed the bet. It's a different system. Yeah, it's, yeah, it automatically hits as free play. The second they download it on there and they spin, it automatically steps the free play meter. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And what about Encore or Boston Harbor? They're using a similar version of the IGT, so this would, they basically benefit from MGM's request. The, that's yes. what I wondered. Yeah. It would actually apply to Encore Boston yes. Harbor. Have you had conversations with them? Are they anticipating the change? If we have. Okay. We've had it with their... Um, with their casino accounting team, and I think Bruce has had it with the slots team. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I read the memo which, and, and the letter, which I think is well uh, articulated. Let me, let me see if I got it. The bottom line was, are we effectively now, by moving to this um, CEPI, recognizing all of the free play that the patron might be given up front, wherever they go and spend it, not what they're given up front, just what they play at that machine. At that machine. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so when they get a balance on their ticket out, for example, that so may still contain the free play? It will go back to their player card, basically. Okay. And that also is registered if they change to another machine, that will be also registered in this new meter. Correct. The in meter. Correct. The same uh, way the time. same way ACSC works right now. Okay. So you download your free play on there. When you pull your card, it comes back off, and whatever's remaining, you can move to the next machine with. Okay. That was one of the options they actually looked at, though, just um, turning the free play into tickets, so that it would just go down and then come off on, on a ticket. But if you lost that ticket versus a player card, it's just it was kind of so. I, it's very simplified here, but the things that the IT team with MGM, with IGT on our central management system and our uh, technology division went through was very, very deep. And, you know, they came up with three recommendations to us. Um, I think it would be helpful if Scott, and, and I don't know if you need Priya too, yeah, on your can, side, Scott, but Priya's right behind you. If they um, went through the technical differences between the options, um, I know you're recommending a particular option, but I like that you've set yeah. forth three options, so if you want to go through it in a way that uh, we can attempt to sure. understand. Yeah, no, and I'll, I'll, um, I can keep it very, um, very high level, so Thank to speak. You. You're welcome, absolutely. <laughs> um, so in option one, um, we had looked at actually um, making the change on the host of our system that does a lot of the calculations and, and such for us. Um, but we found that to be a little time consuming and a little expensive. Um, so option two that was presented, we um, decided to just make the, the change in the meters assignment. So whenever the meters would come in, the system would, um, at the site, would actually do the work to change the meter from where it came from originally to the new location so that when it comes onto the host, we were, the calculations would, would match up and the meters would fall where they're supposed to. Um, and that one was the most effective and, and one that we knew we could implement in a, a short timeline. And then the third option we gave is to basically do nothing and tell MGM, hey, sorry that first you know, put a promo and, and on cord, you know, um, it's, it's kind of gone away. But we knew that was, uh, that was one that wasn't effective for everybody and, and not a little fair to everybody. So we put it in there, but, um, you know, we really didn't talk too much about it. So. Because the net effect of that option three would be that taxation of the free play, which is not what's intended in the statute or correct. the regulation. Right, correct, correct. Okay. correct. And just for one other piece, the reason we really felt comfortable with number two is it's already being done. We're turning one meter 
in, in dropping it into the same meter that basically the ACSC is dropping it into. And now it's just saying instead of directing this meter over there, direct that meter over there. So we know it works. It's, it's something that we have kind of feel comfortable with the technology that's already going versus putting a whole new field into a table onto a billing system that we're not even <laughs> have never tested in the past. We'd have to run it through GLI's lab. Correct. It would take a hash change. It would take a lot more. Mm -hmm. And even then, we don't really have an experienced environment yeah. to test it on where we know this other process works. Correct. So, so it's fair to say that it's not going to cost us um, anything with, um, with the CMS modifications? Correct. You know, any new reporting or new tables that we now have to no, because it's just coding on the on the um, MTSCs with a multi-terminal multi site controllers, <laughs> yeah, which are basically you've got six of those for every property. You know, you get up to 300 or 500, 300 per per yeah. bank. Yeah. So Scott, I'm oh, going. No, I, so I think it's fair to say that you're very comfortable with this option that it meets our needs. And uh, or else you wouldn't be recommending to us that we approve this request. That's correct. Yeah, and I just need one clarification because I'm assuming the same. But number one, the genesis of number one, was that the original recommendation out of it? No, that was just one that just we a, thought of. You thought of and, yeah. and decided it was complicated, more expensive. Number two, and you're not giving up anything in terms no. of effectiveness because no. of cost. Correct. Yeah, this will not affect any performance issues on our, our house system, our CMS system. If you're building a system from scratch, number one is ideal, right? Right. Because uh, there's no conversion. Th you're okay. just putting it straight through. Thank you. But we have a already canned system to then go back and try to change a canned system. It's easier to just do the conversion. That's really much helpful. More. That's mm, really helpful, yeah, Derek. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm wondering, uh, this could be a, a, a discussion for a little later, uh, but um, if the licensees are due a credit back on the effective tax that we have taxed them for all the free play that well, we tax them. Currently, as you know, it's uh, on the CEP is not calculating correctly. That's why we want to put the CEPI in. And it has cost the licensees additional tax revenue. Uh, so for MGM in 2018, in tax revenue, it was 34000 that they paid in addition to us. 2019 was 128,000. In year to date, 2,000 was 7,500 dollars. So we talked from the beginning. Yeah, and Encore Boston Harbor, 2019 was 103,000 dollars. In year to date, was 16,000 dollars. So it, uh, I mean, they're aware of it, and that is uh, why the discussions have gone on, and we want to make this change. So, I don't want to. I'm sure they're going to request it. But this was also the system that they that they approved and implemented here. So, you know, there's there's a there's a good case. I would be requesting if I were on their seats. But there's also a case for the Commonwealth to say, well, it was a system that you recommended, and and and, and it sounds as though that would be something that would come yeah, before come us at another us, time, and we would uh, give a full we, analysis. We would have a so, full analysis. Yeah. But I think okay. you've raised a fair point. The good news is that this has come to our attention and there's corrective action in, in terms of the timeline for that corrective action. After, um, after today, we'll start to work with the um, IGT staff that, runs, that helps run our CMS um, to come up with a, um, a timeline and, and an implementation plan that, that's effective for everybody. Right. And maybe the but, words co corrective action aren't really um, precise. It's yeah. requested action. And it will address what looks like an issue that they've they've noted, and they've asked for some relief. And with a um, a vote today, you're looking for that today. So no vote. This no is vote. just an update. Um, this is. You don't need um, any uh, uh, formal action for nope. you to proceed. No, nope. just an update. Um, and the the other piece is we the plan that we do um, intend on rolling out is a very slow and deliberate one. We'll start off um, with hopefully one. MTSC yeah, at a time correct. at the facilities and hope that over, you know, a week to two weeks we'll have all of the machines switched over to reporting the correct way. Um, this is one in a precautionary manner in case there's anything we didn't anticipate that happens, we can switch it back after one 
one bank, basically, one terminal hits. And the second piece is there are going to be a lot of accounting corrections because you're substituting one meter for a completely other one. So you have to snap both of them and then go back and do manual adjustments on our side mm -hmm. um, to do the gross <coughs> gaming calculation. So it's going to tax both our accounting team as well as our IT team. Mm -hmm. Any questions? No, I think I'm, uh, I'm you know, very impressed with uh, your handling of all the technological aspects, which, you know, I, I can only begin to understand conceptually. And uh, But I know that uh, we have a complicated, a complex, not complicated, a complex, sophisticated system that systems that operate with our CMS. And I'm glad this was brought to the attention and we're able to uh, corroborate uh, and uh, and be comfortable with um, with what they're requesting. Um, so I'm comfortable as well. And I, I just want to point out one la one thing before um, any other questions. Once again, I get to sit up here and do the presentation and the talking, but the majority of the work was all the these four um, individuals and their teams. Um, a lot of work. Um, goes into it to one, go out and investigate these issues, come back and report on them, and then find a solution. Because the easiest thing would have been just number three, hey, this is what you guys asked for. We approved your system. Um, but to actually understand the request, see what was going on from the licensee's point of view, make sure the patrons aren't getting um, impacted in a negative manner with any changes, I, I have to give a lot of credit to the, to the collaboration and work over here. Agreed. That's really apparent how well the team worked together and came up with a workable solution. Good work. And, and what's unique is that this is really cross-departmental. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. so we credit that collaboration. We have finance. We've got our, our, our gaming floor expert, Bruce Ban there, and of course our wonderful IT team. So it shows a, a great presentation for us, Karen, to see um, what's going on on a, on a daily basis and operationally. Mm -hmm. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Moving on to item now 3C, Interim Executive Director Wells. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the uh, next item on the agenda is uh, an update uh, for the use of casino employee dining rooms. Uh, we have been working on this with the casinos uh, so that individuals who work at the casinos, in particular the uh, gaming agents and the state police, have the ability to uh, buy at-cost meals uh, at the employee, uh, employee uh, dining rooms. I, I am personally very much in favor of this change to the policy because it uh, recognizes that it's very difficult sometimes to work a 24-7 operation and sometimes the Either, for example, state police may have to work overtime or work a shift and they don't have food and you don't really want them leaving the property at 3 o'clock in the morning to go look for food. A, they might not be able to find something and B, it's not good to use, a good use of your time and C, it may not be the safest thing to have our employees off uh, looking for uh, open restaurants or open places where they can get something to eat at off hours. So my recommendation is that the Commission adopt the new policy, which gives some flexibility. It also, um, given that it requires that uh, the individuals who work, are, they pay for their food. So I think it does cover the ethics issue of, you know, getting gifts or anything uh, as a result of their employment at the Gaming Commission or the state police assigned to the property. But I think it's really important to recognize that uh, these individuals who work uh, at a 24-7 operation have a different circumstance than, than we do, and it may be more difficult, and we just have to acknowledge that um, what they're doing and make their jobs uh, as easy as possible, e it, and as simple as getting something to eat for dinner or for lunch or for breakfast. Have we um, spoken with licensees about yes. implementing yes. such a policy and yes. they have a way of doing this right. um, so that people realize, I think this was always a, a bigger perception issue. Correct. Um, then uh, just making sure folks know there's no benefit and that they are paying for their meals. And, and that's been worked out. Yes, and uh, 
I will commend Executive Director Bedrosian had been working on this for, with the licensees for, for quite some time. So I just want to bring that to fruition. Uh, we will work out the, the fine details on, you know, the payment and all that. But it was a little complicated to, to make sure that there was a, um, a fair way to be uh, charged at fair market value and not get some additional benefit. So yeah. that, that worked out. In, in, in practice, I certainly agree. Having worked those kinds of shifts, I know that yeah, that is sorry. always a difficult uh, situation. So, um, yeah, I would agree as long as the system is in place so that, uh, so that everyone on both ends uh, understand and um, abide by the policy. No, I, I would agree. Having been at Encore right before the opening and witnessed firsthand <clears throat> how much of an effort it was to just keep enough food and drink there to keep everybody going in on the floor. Mm -hmm. I, I think this strikes an appropriate balance in terms of ethics, safety, and just efficacy of making sure people can get what they need to do their job. I think it's appropriate. Same here. I'm all in favor for this on, on this. Uh, just a clarification. Um, employees can also go elsewhere to the normal, uh, not, the, not just the employee dining room, but uh, all the other outlets if they so yes, choose. and, and uh, oh, okay. Mr. Grossman, the legal team reviewed that. It's it, the issue is the at cost, so that they yeah. mm -hmm. basically don't get an enhanced benefit. Don't have a benefit from the discount Correct. Um, of the meal. But they may go to the other restaurants, even if there's a cafeteria present. Correct, right? Yeah, we uh, the enhanced code of ethics allows employees to purchase food at those type of establishments at the posted menu prices uh, to ensure that there's uh, no gift, no unwarranted privilege, anything of that nature. This wasn't addressed in the enhanced code, and that's the, the reason for this particular policy. Mm -hmm. well, that's an interesting clarification. Um, go right ahead. It is. Well, I suspect there'll be availing themselves of the cafeteria due to mm -hmm. the costs out at uh, these facilities. So, yep. yeah. Well, I, I, you know, maybe it's Dunkin' Donuts, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Slice yeah. may not be the same as Red Egg. And, and I whatever. think at, at Plainville they have a very limited in-house dining option, correct? Yeah. I does not, does have, not have a, a dining room. Well, they, have, they, they have, have a cafeteria have an with yet. machines right. that you could purchase something from a sh machine, but that's right. what I'm saying, very limited. Right. Yep. So to be clear, under the enhanced code of ethics current version, any employee can go to any dining establishment and pay cost currently under the current law. I think there may have been some hint of discouragement from on, on that because of the perception issue that um, Commissioner Cameron just raised. So we're hearing that, to, again, as a reminder under the current ethics, uh, code, uh, enhanced code of ethics under, uh, it's really a regulation of sorts, they may go to those. This clarifies that for where there is a cafeteria, and we have two facilities that have a employee kept here, they may now go and receive um, the, the, not the benefit of the employee discount, or they may receive that. Not the benefit. No, so not that's, benefit. you've, you've but hit the nail right on the But they may avail there. themselves of the cafeteria. Somehow, the, at, at cost, somehow the cafeteria was not included under the code of ethics. That's right. The issue okay. with the cafeteria is that either there may not be posted menu prices. Mm -hmm. The prices would be highly subsidized, or the meals may be offered for free. For free, right. We couldn't allow any of that. So that's why it wasn't covered in the enhanced code. Right. But in a situation like this, if we can ensure that our employees are paying fair market value and not gaining any benefit that the employees at the casino would get, then it wouldn't violate any of the state conflict of interest laws or our rules against receiving gifts. By way of background, we were uh, advised that as these would essentially be the same prices that some of their vendors would pay when they come in in the back of the house to eat in their cafeterias. We actually have documentation from 
MGM and uh, Encore as to the market prices in this situation. I, okay, go could ahead. you refresh my memory? Didn't our original policy say that you could purchase an item, but then not sit in the restaurant and consume that item? So our initial policy didn't address this at all. What we did, now this is dating back a year or two when the commission amended the enhanced code, you'll recall was said you could actually purchase food at these outlets at posted menu prices provided that you're mindful of the appearance of this so that you can buy it but you really shouldn't sit there and eat it or certainly go into a restaurant and you know um, take a table and you know that whole thing but that if you take it back to our office or what have you and you paid for it then that's okay so this is why there is some confusion. You know, I um, did understand that there was a perception issue, and that's why people, our gaming agents might choose not to avail themselves of buying anything at the restaurants, and that's why um, we were concerned about them going off premises at 3 in the morning. Now, maybe some of the restaurants are, sh are closed and there aren't as many choices at that hour. But what we're hearing today is that if they um, buy at market value at any of the uh, restaurants on site and they bring their uh, meals back to the uh, dedicated space for the gaming commission, we don't have concerns about an appearance issue. Is that fair? Yep. Mm -hmm. So they have those choices and then they now will have the option for the two cafeterias to um, have a price list and be able to, to pay fair market value. That's right. And as uh, Ms. Wells pointed out, I think the devil will be in the details. We'll have to work out the, uh, as Commissioner Cameron also mentioned, how this will actually work and what the process will be and all of that. But well, in principle, obviously, the commission has to be comfortable with that. Well, and then the next question I would have is, do we want to also encourage our employees to take the food from the cafeteria to the um, to their uh, MGC premises on site. I don't think you have quite the appearance issue though, because don't, I think both of the dining halls are well, back of house. And well, I think there, I've heard that there might be an appearance issue, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would agree it's an appearance issue to have the regulators sitting with employees. So, do we need to discuss that now? The reason why I'm drilling down a little bit is that there seems to be a lack of clarity for our, our folks out there. And I think today is a good day to just give, you know, very clear guidance as to what we feel is um, really a true risk of abuse of our position. That's what we're looking at here. What is the risk of the abuse of our position? And appearances could, could create that risk. And so we're assessing really what the risk is and giving guidance so that they don't feel uncomfortable per making a purchase or they are directed to, to make a purchase elsewhere. So Bruce, uh, Commissioner Stebbins, do you have some thoughts on this that you've seen over the years when you've visited the various sites? Yeah, I, it's, you know, I'm, first of all, I'm in, in favor of the policy. I think, you know, it's, it, it is addressing a, um, a certain situation, right? We're really thinking about our overnight folks, folks working a shift where they can't run out and grab something. If that was an option, I certainly agree that it's better to have our team on site as opposed to off site. Uh, you know, I, I feel comfortable if we gave some direction at this point as we kind of roll this out, as we're incorporating this in, giving the employees the option to encourage them to go back to our space. Um, you know, again, I think the original idea was we didn't want to have a gaming employee sitting at Chandler's having a nice steak dinner, eating it there, because um, it did it could raise appearance issues. I would just say for now, for the uh, for the kind of initial startup period, obviously the food options are available, but you know, encourage staff to to take it back to you know the conference room space or our dedicated space. You know. Just, just to be cautious. But from the cafeteria. From the cafeteria, okay. the employee dining room. I, I, I I'm I, not I, as concerned with that appearance. I, I, I think.
you know, it might actually defeat a little bit of the purpose of trying to be efficient with the time. I know it's not the same uh, as having to go off premises, but I, I, um, I think, you know, people have to exercise judgment as to the situation in which they, how they interact with other employees. And that's true not just for, that, that has been true already for how we I interact with the people that we regulate. So I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with both the policy as it states as, and also offering the guidance that simply exercise judgment, but from my perspective, it's fine to do it there because there's, those facilities are available. Are you making a distinction between the employee dining yes. room and say yes. at PPC they go to Dunkin' Donuts and get something not yes. That's correct. eating in the public? The distinction here, and I, and I want to be clear, yes, the, the, the appearance in the public about a steak dinner at Chandler's is very different from what we're talking about. I, in the, the enhanced code of ethics continues to have that guidance, and in my opinion, should, mm -hmm. uh, um, as to you know, offer, um, purchasing um, a food uh, on those outlets that are open to the public. Um, I, I would say that in, in terms of the rollout, one of the other things to reinforce, in addition to the enhanced code of ethics and the public versus the back of house, is just being mindful of what you talk about. You know, it's like being in a courthouse and chatting in the elevator about a case and you really shouldn't do it. So to the, the, the only added risk, I think, in behavior in terms of back of house cafeteria is, while it may be more, you know, less formal and you may not be there with the public, please remember this is, these are not your employees, these are not your coworkers, and just be mindful of what you're talking about. So part of the rollout probably is just a reinforcement of behaviors in that regard. Mm -hmm. I, I, had, I agree. That's my point about yeah. judgment exercising. Right. Yeah. Uh, had the team contemplated this, uh, Director Wells? Well, the the language in the in the yeah. proposal is that MGC employees will be permitted to eat their meal in the licensee's employee cafeteria or dining room mm -hmm. space. So the way we'd set it up, they were permitted to get it and eat it there. And if you want it different, well, but but did you, you just? Was, was there any concern about that when this was? Well, the, the, I think the thinking at the time uh, was that uh, it was the back of the house and there's not that public perception that people are getting free food from the casinos and therefore were somewhat compromised. I guess, was there any discussion around the, the regulator sitting with the employees? Was there discussion about that? I don't, I don't know. I, we, did, we did talk about that, okay. um, but, you know, we were drawing a line between people sitting out in the public and where everyone can see and maybe wonder whether they paid for it or not in a more controlled environment where perhaps everyone would know that employees and employees of the Gaming Commission pay a certain rate or what have you. Um, it seemed to be less of a risk and less of an appearance issue and that's why we suggested that it's okay that there's no appearance or less of an appearance issue. But ultimately, as you've identified, it, it is, of course, up to the commission to decide what your comfort level is. I don't think it's a legal matter at that point. It's really a matter of judgment and what the appearance is. Do you want to add a line to the policy around that where the exercise of judgment, or do you want to just have it be in the rollout? No, I think the rollout and also because the overall enhanced code still encourages people in terms of if there is any appearance of impropriety potential to take it back to your own space. So in terms of the rollout saying you can do this, it's fine there, you know, however, if you are in a circumstance even there that you're encouraged to sort of take it back. But that to me, I'm not so sure I'd codify it in this language so much as just in the rollout reiterate it. That's where I'm coming. I, I, think, I think you raise a good point. I think it just kind of mirrors the practice that our employees engage in every day, right? They understand the relationship as a regulator with the regular, regulatee, um, but you know they're mindful of the conversations that they have, whether it's on the gaming floor or elsewhere. So, you know, just to, to reinforce that sensitivity again, if they're going to be um, in and around, you know, our licensees, employees that they remain sensitive to it. They're sensitive to it already. It's just kind of reaffirming that if they're going to be take, you know, using the employee dining room or any back, any back house space. Absolutely. And I, I would just um, 
point out, as you know, we have our annual ethics training, and this is an issue that comes up every year. And we are always sure to address this matter, and oftentimes we get a lot of questions about what you can and can't do, but we can maybe even beef up that section of the training a little more this year with the addition of this policy, and maybe even circulate this policy office-wide so everyone's aware uh, that it's now part of the personnel manual anticipating what your vote may be here. Um, and just point, point that out. Commissioner Cameron? Now, I, I guess I would be, I, of course, rolling through my head are all the incidents I know about in the past where folks have gotten themselves in trouble in public uh, restaurants. And um, so I, I would just, uh, yeah, if, if we roll it out in a way that people are reminded uh, about their responsibilities, that they are, uh, you know, they have oversight for those folks that are sharing that dining facility. I think that would be an important piece and, um, and that we're expecting them to behave professionally and if we find there are instances where they don't, we could revisit this. So in this instance, we are um, asked to uh, adopt this formally through a vote. Uh, I think I would just add, I had been very eager to see this policy adopt, adopted because I do think it's essential for us to uh, ensure fair and safe access to food. And uh, that's the priority with respect to the perceptions of where we dine, um, I do uh, recognize that our employees are in the public setting in, in all forms and fashions, not just when they're eating. Mm -hmm. And so we, we do expect all of our um, employees to exercise that professionalism. And so to the extent it's helpful to give that guidance, perhaps even in the rollout language, I'm, I'm comfortable with the way that the policy is written here. All right, I can take care of that. So, um, so, Madam Chair, I would move that uh, to amend the Commission's uh, personnel manual to include the MGC Employee and Gaming Enforcement Unit Casino Dining uh, Policy, as discussed here today and as included in the Commissioner's packet, subject to any grammatical or immaterial changes. Second. Any further discussion? Just a big thank you to the, for the work. Uh, Thank you. Chupti and Carrie and, and Todd and Karen, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. So that, that concludes Section 3. Thank you very much. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we'll, we'll go back to item number two, and that's uh, Commissioner Stebbins on the approval of the minutes, please. Sure, Madam Chair, in your packet, we have the meeting minutes from the February 27, 2020 meeting out in Springfield. Uh, I'd move the approval of the minutes is always subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Before we adopt, any edits, questions, comments? Excellent. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, Shara. Excellent job. Moving on to item number four, Ombudsman Ziamba. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. On the agenda today are the quarterly reports for the fourth quarter of 2019, ending on December 31st, 2019, for Plain Ridge Park in Encore Boston Harbor. Although the focus of the reports will be on the fourth quarter activities, as mentioned by the chair, we have asked each of them to provide some information on their coronavirus uh, preparations. So why don't we uh, dial them up. Up first, we ask Plain Ridge uh, Park uh, to present its quarterly report. Representing Plain Ridge Park um, for their quarterly report will be Dana Fortney. Vice President of Finance, Mike Muller, Vice President of Operations, Kathy Lucas, Vice President of Human Resources, and Lisa McKenney, Compliance Manager. 
So uh, I just wanted to go over a little bit of, of what we what we did to try to uh, ensure this this goes as smoothly as possible. What we said is that we would before making the phone call we would call them up to make sure that they were there aware that they knew that once they uh, answered the phone that they would be live that they should be in a quiet room um, and and that they should Hello. indicate Hi. speaking. Welcome Plain Ridge Park. Thank you. Great. So um, I was just going over some of the uh, some of the measures that we took to ensure that this goes as smoothly as possible. Thank you for being there and taking the call. So with that, uh, let me turn it over uh, to Plain Ridge Park to begin its presentation. Uh, before we start, just a good morning to um, all of you and uh, thank you for Thank you for, we're just um, still working on mechanics here. Just thank you for your remote participation. I, I tried to imagine what it would feel like today. I guess it is truly uh, phoning a friend. So we appreciate um, uh, um, your providing this uh, remotely and appreciate that, uh, again, the report was done in timely fashion given this very, uh, critical time. We know that you folks have been very busy uh, addressing the coronavirus, but you are also um, making sure to fulfill the statutory obligations under 23K to report to us today. So thank you. This is Dana Fortney. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're, we're happy to be here today, and, and we appreciate being permitted to present remotely. Before we begin with our quarterly presentation, I would like to introduce Greg DeMarco. He is our Director of Security and Risk. He's going to provide a short statement on our initiatives relating to COVID-19. Hello, Greg DeMarco, Director of Security, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Plain Ridge Park Casino is committed to providing a safe and clean environment to our guests and team members. In relation to COVID-19 virus, we continue to closely monitor information from our local public health, as well as the Center for Disease Control. Currently, the casino and public areas are cleaned on an increased cleaning rotation. We have ensured that all team members are following safe sanitation protocols, as well as frequent hand washing. In addition, the following items have been implemented for further guest safety. Increased fresh air circulation, more frequent public restrooms, cleaning rotations, additional sanitation stations, increased sanitation of door handles and gaming devices, increased communication awareness training at the property, continue awareness amongst the team members regarding cleanliness and sanitation, for example, hand washing, sanitation of menus after each guest use in all our food and beverage venues, additional carpet cleaning, more frequent cleaning of elevator buttons, added communication on our property website and social media. These communications provide links and references to Mass Department of Health and CDC. We continue to share best practice with our sister properties as well with our fellow licensees. We are committed to working with the public health agencies and we'll adjust our efforts as necessary. With that, I'm turning back the presentation to Dana Fortney, VP of Finance. Thank you, Greg. This is Dana again. Before we move on to the presentation, um, I wanted to give a moment to see if anyone had any questions. No? Okay, moving straight into uh, page two of our presentation. Um, this morning, as we mentioned, I have Mike Mueller, VP of Operations, as well as Kathy Lucas, VP of Human Resources. So to page two, gaming revenue and taxes. We have a lot of information on this slide, so I'll draw your eyes to the second row. For the fourth quarter of 2019, Plainridge generated over $32 million in slot revenue, and taxes paid came in just under $16 million. The year-over-year -year decline in revenue of $8 million for the fourth quarter is driven by continued impact of Encore Boston Harbor. As we've mentioned, the property anticipated this opening and the decline in revenue does not change our operation. Slide three is lottery sales. 
Looking at the second to last year of the table, lottery sales came in at 794000 for the fourth quarter of 2019. Similar to spot revenue, lottery sales were down year over year by 74000 or 8.5%. We anticipate this trend to continue with changes in gaming revenue. However, we are very pleased with the results from 2019. Slide four is our spend by state for the fourth quarter. In-state spend was 962,000 or 53%, down slightly from the third quarter, but in line with 2019 as a whole. The remaining spend for the quarter is split amongst the states on the right. Overall qualified spend was up 260000 from Q3 to Q4, which impacted our percentages. The change in qualified spend is due to the timing of our capital-related projects, of which we had two large projects that were paid in the fourth quarter. Slide 5 is our spend by state for the year of 2019. In-state spend was $3.44 million, or 53% down from 2018 total in-state spend of $5.07 million, or 74%. The variance is applicable to the change of our primary food provider from Cisco to U.S. Foods earlier in 2019, which is now included in the New Hampshire spend. Overall, qualified spend decreased by 5.2%. The next slide is our local spend for the fourth quarter. In-state versus local spend shows a slight decrease from the third quarter of 23000 however, in line with the second quarter spend of 77000 The third quarter held some one-time expenses relating to our transition of our loyalty program, which we were able to utilize a vendor from Mansfield for some of that work. Slide 7 is our local spend for all of 2019. Annual local spend came in at 9% or 322000 a couple of great stories to highlight on this slide. In 2018, we partnered with Bristol Construction out of Rentham to redo the roofs on our barns. Uh, since then, they've become a great vendor for us. They've completed multiple projects, such as the renovation of our concession stand out on the racing apron and the construction of a shed at the horse trailer entrance. Also to highlight is Matt Graphics out of Mansfield, who has also been a great partner since opening, doing a large amount of our banners and indoor signage. I will now pass the presentation over to Mike Mueller. Any, any questions on these uh, slides so far before we transition? Um, uh, Bruce, one, I'm sorry. Commissioner one just qu uh, Quick one, Dana. What was your overall local spending in 2018? It, let me grab that number for you. It was around the 700,000 mark. It included um, multiple large projects that were one-time projects in that year. Like I mentioned, the re-roofing of our barns for racing, as well as um, a capital project of our basement room, um, where we added some solar power shades and a few other items. All right, thank you. Any other questions for Dana right now? Thank you, Dana. We'll, we'll come back to you if we have additional questions. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Mike Mueller, Vice President of Operations. Moving on to the next slide, we will look at vendor diversity. Uh, for Q4, we met our diversity spend goal of 21%. While we missed slightly in the WBE and MBE categories for the quarter, we exceeded our goal in veteran spend. For WBE, we had seven partners that had yet to complete their registration under the new definitions. Since this had not been completed as of the end of Q4, we could not attribute any of those spends to our Q4 numbers, thereby leaving us short of our goal. However, we are actively working with these companies to ensure their certifications for Q1. Moving to the next slide. Can I just... For year to date... I'm sorry, can I just stop here for a moment? This is Commissioner O'Brien. If those yes. vendors were WB certified, what would the percentage be? Uh, I, right now, I don't have the exact number. I can get that for you from our procurement uh, person. Okay. Thank you. Yes. For year to date to 2019, we exceeded our goals in every category with WBE coming in at 16%. 
on a goal of 12%. MBE came in at 7% on a goal of 6%, and Veteran was at 5% on a goal of 3 for a total diversity spend of 28% on a goal of 21 for 2019. I would just take a moment and congratulate you, Mike, and Eli, and the whole team for um, surpassing your goals in 2019. Thank you. We appreciate it. And, and this is Chair Judd Stein. I, I also echo that. Um, I do want to return to the earlier slide, though, because if um, the explanation is certifications, I understand, but I, I cannot remember, and I did not have the chance to look back at the slide from the third quarter. Is the trend that we see for the fourth quarter, is it, is it a trend, is it, or do you think that uh, the um, results for the fourth quarter are an anomaly? Because it looks like we might no, be turning we, down. We feel that when we get these uh, companies to certify, that we'll be able to utilize those spends, and it will come back into these categories. And that's across the board for all, all three categories? Mainly just the WBE and the MBE. Okay. I know we're doing well with the VBE. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll, yes. we'll look forward to the, the next quarter report. And, and, and if you, um, I'm assuming that you are getting help from the proper state um, offices for the certification process? Yes. Okay. And of course, we have internally uh, Jill Griffin, Director. Uh, Griffin, who could be of um, assistance as well. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the next slide, we're looking at uh, a new diverse spend slide where we have shown some decreases in Q4 as compared to Q3 of 2019. As you can see from the bottom line, our qualified spend increased over a quarter of a million from Q3 to Q4, mainly due to some capital projects that were completed in Q4. For WBE, we saw our total spend dropped to $39,770, or 17.4%, again, due to the definitions that we just discussed on the previous slide. For MBE, we also saw a drop in the quarter of 48664 In the past, we previously accepted any state's MBE certifications, but now under the new MBE definitions, we only accept those recognized by the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council or by the Supplier Diversity Office. Uh, again, not being able to accept those spends that fell outside of this new definition has led to, to the decline in the MBE category. And as stated earlier, uh, we're still working with these MBE companies to obtain their proper certifications for Q1. Next slide is compliance. Looking at compliance in three months of Q4, we had 13,963 ID checks. Of those ID checks, we had a total of 373 patrons that were prevented from entering. Of those 373, 18 were minors, so 77 were underage, and the remaining 278 had either an expired ID, an invalid ID, or no ID. We did have one minor that gained access to the floor for a total of six minutes and 48 seconds in October, and they did not gain. Next slide. Again, uh, this is Commissioner Cameron. Those, those numbers are always strong with your property, so I, I really do commend you for the work you do here. And, um, you know, that's even that six minutes and 48 seconds for the one minor. So really, really good work and, you know, good by the whole team to keep those numbers so low or usually we have zero. So that's very good work. And I'm turning to Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner O'Brien for your expertise, but with respect to the uh, presentation of expired or invalid IDs, do you think that the number decreasing is because the word is getting out? Or uh, I, I suspect it's, it's two things. Yes, I do think young people will test a property and the word will get around, hey, we got in, you can get in. But I also think in particular with this property, they do a very good job. At, at really um, their enforcement efforts, their, their checking, they're, they're, they're really um, just vigilant with this particular issue and it, it demonstrates so quarter after quarter in their numbers. Uh, you know, also the location. I mean, 
many more colleges in, in the Boston area, in the, in the Springfield area, much bigger properties. So we understand that as well. But I, I know that they put a great effort here and it, it, it pays off. We do appreciate that. Thank you. Moving on to the next slide. I'm going to touch on some marketing events that we had in Q4. Some of our highlights included an Arabian Nights themed New Year's Eve event for our guests. We also hosted a Patriots game day experience for some of our top players. We also worked with the MGC, the Lottery, the Massachusetts Council of Compulsive Gambling, and the Massachusetts Partnership on Responsible Gaming to provide gifts to needy children for the holidays that benefited the Toys for Tots organization. Actually, I missed a slide. I apologize. We're going to go to local community. That's what's up there right now. Uh, in Q4, we continued to support our local community through a donation to the Doug Flutie Jr. Foundation for Autism, and we donated school supplies to the North Attleboro YMCA. We also held a community blood drive for the American Red Cross at our facility, and finally we made monetary donations to Lenore's Pantry in North Attleboro and to the town of Mansfield. Now to the final slide of marketing. Uh, in addition to the things that I just touched on, we also had Nesson's Dining Playbook on property where local hosts Billy Costa and Jenny Johnson came to review both of our Flutie's Sports Pub and our Slack's Oyster House and Grill for their television show. I happen to really like that show. So Any questions? <laughs> that's, Any further that's questions? That's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah. Any any questions or comments for this um, presentation? And these last two slides are on the earlier slides. Okay, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kathy Lucas to finish up. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to reference the employment slides. All employees referenced in this slide were current as of Q4 2019. During the quarter, we had 485 team members employed. We exceeded our diversity goal of 15% in Q4 at 26%. We use our referral program along with this. We're attending, actually, the job fairs that we were attending, um, the mass hire job fairs on 312 and Easton and 324 have been canceled as of this morning. Um, we're going to look for the uh, postponement date. So we will be attending those when we get the new date. We exceeded our veterans goal of 2% in Q4 2019 at 5%. We held a veterans job fair on property, and we also offered the applicants quick processing and lunch at Bleedies who attended that job fair. We had five candidates come through, and of those five, we hired one. We're attending the Greater Boston Veterans Job Fair on March 26th at Gillette Stadium. We remain steady with our women's goal of 50% in Q4 2019 at 48%. We're focused on attracting women by partnering with organizations like Women's Link, where we hosted a networking luncheon for 60 women at the property. We also partnered with Alpha Kappa Alpha, the first sorority founded by African American women, providing them sponsorship for their job fair, which had 2,800 members and was also open to the community attracting an additional 500 people. We are consistent with our recruiting for our local goal of 35% in Q4 at 32%. This includes Attleboro, Foxboro, Mansville, North Attleboro, Plainville, and Renton. We'll go to the next slide. This is the first time we're reporting out this information to the group. I would tell you our focus on developing women at the supervisor level and above through women leading at 10 and external recruitment is incredibly important because we'd like to see the 39% increase. If you go to the next slide, I'll share some of the things that we're working on for that. In Q4, women leading at 10 focus was on navigating the workforce. We focused on effective coaches and using the Penn Gaming model, we helped our managers set expectations with their team members, focus on how to coach effectively, and then provide feedback to either encouraged or corrected behavior. 
when we talk about re redirecting behavior, we gave these managers the opportunity to discover why people would go wrong, identify some of the challenges, help you change, and encourage better behaviors. For women leading at 10, in 2018, we had 16 participants. In 2019, we had 14 participants. In 2019, eight of our participants were promoted or are in more complex roles at PPC. In 2019, we also had two of our participants transfer within the Penn organization. For 2020, we are currently recruiting, and we have invited 17 team members to participate in the program along with our three sponsors, Dana, Michelle, and I. Our focus for 2019 will be on performance manager, helping our women leaders with managing their team through effective coaching, mentoring, and positive intent with their team. Kathy, can I stop? Can I conclude in my report? Any questions? Yes, this is Commissioner Cameron. I know that uh, this this pro this program started under your pre predecessor. Um, I love this program. I did get a chance to speak to a lot of the young women, and the most uh, impressive thing I heard was these young women. And this was the first year of the program, by the way. Um, say, I, I I couldn't see myself as a supervisor. And because of this program, I can now see myself, and I know that I can do it. I know I can reach that next level. And um, so that was really an important um, message that they were receiving and the encouragement to, to strive to, to take a new position and to, to get yourself prepared to be successful in that new position. So I just want to commend you and your team for this program. and. Um, I'm sure you can see that the, the results are there. Absolutely, absolutely. And as we look at the programs for 2020, um, our introduction to some new members has been um, well received. So while we'll have a couple of folks that are continuing with us, um, we're excited that we have new team members that are joining us for development. And they can obviously look at you and, and see that um, it's possible to you know, achieve at the highest levels and to, to continue focusing on moving up in their career. So really good work. Thanks. Thank you. Kathy, this, this is, is Kathy, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yep, Kathy, this is Commissioner Stebbins also just to, to echo the congrats on the success of women leading at Penn and for including the new slide. Um, I did note under your all employees slide previously, um, it's changed a little bit since the last quarter. You guys used to provide a breakout of number of full time and number of employees and broken it out by full and part time. Um, of the 485, um, do you have a breakout of what full time and part time numbers were? Uh, I can provide that to you along with the information that we have to provide from a previous slide. Um, we, we got the slide change, so we didn't update that number, but we do definitely have that information for you. Okay. Um, I usually look. I did not have a chance to do it this morning, but how many, uh, how many current openings do you guys have posted? Yeah, I want to say we probably have about 22 posted um, positions, and of that maybe um, about 15% might be in the supervisory or above category. Okay. Um, and one last question, Kathy. I know you mentioned some uh, uh, recruitment and job fairs being postponed. I know there's an active effort down in um, the Foxboro, Rentham, Plainville area to try to recruit folks t um, who are using commuter rail that with the extended service down to Foxboro, there might be an opportunity to increase some of your job recruitment in the greater Boston area and maybe catch people on reverse commute. Do you, are you aware of those efforts? And if, if you are, do you have any updates as to how that effort's going? Yeah, absolutely. My team has been working with a small core group of folks that are, are um, working on the, the reverse to new program. We've attended uh, two conference calls, and then uh, Colin Burns, um, one of our team members, attended an in-person meeting, I want to say, uh, earlier in February. So um, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, we're excited uh, if it allows us to open our candidate pool to 
um, a group of people that normally would not look at uh, look at us. Um, the, the, I guess I would say one of the, the biggest barriers is that most of the candidates that would be looking for the uh, reverse commute program are looking at manager level and above. So um, that would provide a, a smaller subscale of, of roles and opportunities, but we're still excited to, to have it as a um, pipeline for candidates. Okay. And we're excited by the fact that, you know, we, you know, you, Town of Plainville, Town of Rentham, and Town of Foxborough continue to work together and uh, some regional strategies around workforce development and tourism. So I appreciate that update, Kathy. Thank you. Absolutely. This is uh, Mike Mueller again. I do have one uh, update to Commissioner O'Brien's question on our Q4 diversity spend earlier. Uh, we were able to pull some data, and if we were able to utilize our uh, affiliates that were not um, certified that if we were able to use that money, the WBE spend for the quarter would have been 12%, which would have met our goal, mm -hmm. and the MBE spend would have been 7%, which is, would have exceeded our goal. Mm -hmm. Well, I say thank you for the numbers, and I also um, applaud you for how quickly you were able to pull it together. I appreciate it. Well, it, thanks. Oh, that's one of the benefits of being here at the property. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, yeah. Life Forest, too. Good point. Yeah. Thank, thank you, and it clarifies my question, too, that it sounds as though it truly isn't a trend, so we appreciate you getting right back. No problem. Thank you. Great. I think that concludes Plain Ridge Park's uh, report. We thank you very much for, for participating uh, in our new format uh, for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to take just um while we're getting uh, folks on the line, we'll take a five minute break. No, no, Marianne, you can get them on the line, but we'll take a five minute break during that time. Great. Thank you so much. We're re I'll say, Austin, thank you. We're reconvening our public meeting number 291. Uh, back to Ombudsman Ziemba. Uh, Chair and Commissioners, we next turn to the quarterly report for Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, here with us today telephonically is Jackie Crum, Senior Vice President and General Counsel for Encore Boston Harbor. Welcome, Jackie. Jackie, before you begin, I just, this is um, Chair Judd Stein, I just want to thank you and the entire team at Encore Boston Harbor for uh, meeting with us in this virtual fashion. You know, your flexibility and cooperation means a great deal. We also want to respect the fact that we know that you have been very, very busy uh, dealing with the coronavirus and uh, you've also fulfilled uh, the operational obligations that your team has to report to us quarterly and uh, despite all the challenges that are going around uh, and we just uh, want to express our gratitude so thank you thank you madam chair and uh, good morning or almost good afternoon commissioners good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just like you we are obviously closely monitoring the new developments regarding COVID-19 uh, we have implemented several new policies and procedures which follow the recommendations from both CDC and DPH. Uh, in addition, we've engaged an outside consultant, uh, Dr. Rebecca Katz, who's the director of the Center for Global Health and Science and Security at Georgetown University Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Katz is advising us on best practices. Communication is obviously paramount, and we are in constant communication with our employees to reinforce our sanitation safety sanitization safety procedures in both guest facing and back of house areas. Uh, we are sanitizing high traffic public areas at an increased frequency. Uh, some, of the, some of the things that we have implemented recently are hand sanitizers are located throughout the public and back of house locations. They are refilled and checked regularly. Uh, all public touch points such as handrails, elevator buttons, telephones, faucets, door handles, and knobs 
are cleaned multiple times throughout the day. We are also cleaning surfaces such as the front desk, restaurant counters, and dining tables. The casino gaming floor slot machines are wiped and surfaces are cleaned on an hourly basis throughout the day. All of our gaming supplies, chips, dice, cards are cleaned, refreshed, or discarded on an ongoing basis throughout each day. Uh, in addition to these measures, we've also established, established some special uh, precautionary measures. Uh, for example, we have started to take the temperature of guests who are exhibiting signs of illness, coughing, sneezing, sweating, etc. Uh, with their permission, we are discreetly taking their temperatures and asking guests with a temperature of 100 degrees or higher uh, to leave our property and, and we encourage them to seek medical attention for further screening or treatment. Our food and beverage operation will continue to hold itself to the highest standards of hygiene and food handling practices. We employ an in-house director of health and food safety who works closely with the city of Everett health inspector to ensure these standards are upheld during this time. All departments have implemented hand washing or sanitizing procedures to take place multiple times during each employee's shift. All, uh, all on-call Boston Harbor employees are prohibited from reporting to work with a respiratory illness that can be transmitted to others. Uh, employees insured by the company have access to health care, who have access to health care, many of whom uh, also have access to a 24-hour telemedicine provider. Finally, uh, we've established a website, oncallbostoninfo.com, to provide uh, updated information to both our employees uh, as well as our guests in a timely manner. Do you have any questions about any of those procedures? Um, Jackie, this is Commissioner Stebbins. On your, on your new website, are you informing guests that if for any reasons they're susceptible or experience an illness that you can tell them off the website where I'm sure you have other information for patrons. Please don't come. Uh, we are, we're constantly revising our website. I don't believe that's up on our website currently, but that is something that we're, we're considering and revising our web, website to reflect as we get new information. Okay. Thank you. So moving on to the quarterly report. Uh, gaming revenue taxes and lottery sale. On our gaming revenue, um, you can see that there is month over month growth. Uh, for October, we were at um, a total of 11.4. In November, 11.8. Uh, sorry, this is on the Massachusetts state, state taxes. And December was 13.5. So increasing growth um, over month, month over month. Moving on to lottery sales, um, we, uh, we had 257,000 uh, in October, 207,000 in November, and 236,000 in December for a total of seven, uh, 701,000 uh, over the last quarter. We're continuing to monitor uh, the results to determine if changes should be implemented. On compliance, um, on the first slide, the minors prevented from gaming. Uh, during the month of October, we intercepted and prevented 15 minors from gaming, November 17 and in December 9 for a total of 41. And uh, while I realize that this is, this is uh, the fourth quarter report, uh, just a sneak peek into February, um, we had zero minors on the gaming floor. Good work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our team is working hard at it. So uh, you'd asked us uh, previously to break down um, how many minors were intercepted at slot machines, tables, consuming alcohol, um, number of IDs not checked that resulted in the gaming floor, and number of fake IDs provided. Uh, so those, uh, those statistics are presented on the next slide. Um, one of the things that we're very much focused on is uh, that fourth category, the number of IDs that are not checked, because that is obviously something that's completely within our within our control. So we're trying very hard to push that number down. Jackie, to that point, this is Chair Judstein. Are you providing uh, targeted training? How are you going to address that? Yes. Yes. So we, we constantly provide training uh, to the security team, encouraging them to check IDs um, and to run IDs even if there's a, a thought that somebody might be on a threshold. 
Um, we also have implemented enhanced procedures for checking fake IDs. So that, um, that number may increase, but we see that as, as actually a positive because we'll, we'll be catching more. And then on the uh, minors intercepted um, at tables, you can see that that number went down in December. Uh, we did see an increase in the minors intercepted at slot machines, so we've increased the patrol of slot machine areas. And we think the minor intercepted uh, gaming at tables decreased as a result of some of the training. Uh, now our dealers are checking more frequently as well. Moving on to uh, operating spend. Um, so what we did here was we provided our uh, third and fourth quarter and broke those down and then also our total uh, 2019 spend. Um, I would, obviously this is only half a year because we, we opened uh, June 23rd. So, um, you know, this isn't reflective of, of an entire year, but I, I think we are proud of our goals. We exceeded uh, the spend, uh, our annual goals in both the minority business and the veterans business. Uh, we do still have some work to do in the women's business enterprises where we'd like to get uh, that 10% up to our goal or exceed our goal of 14%. Uh, moving on to the next slide, which is our operating spend at the local level. Uh, again, this only reflects six months and um, one, of, one of the things that we thought might be valuable uh, the next round is to let you know what we did pre-opening, even though that's not a requirement of this report because we obviously purchased a lot of, um, a lot of supplies pre-opening that are not reflected in these, uh, in these total spends and these annual amounts. Uh, of our total uh, fourth quarter spend, 16.5 uh, uh, million or 58% of our spend uh, was attributable to businesses in Massachusetts. And we're continuing to look at opportunities to grow this. On uh, employment, uh, we have a total of 4,421 employees. That's the figure. That's the current figure as of March 6th. And uh, the breakdown between full-time and part-time is 75% to 25%. And on the next slide, the uh, diversity of the employees. Uh, we have goals of 40% for minorities, which we've exceeded at 54%. 3% for veterans, which we've met, and 50% for women, which we are continuing to work on, uh, which is currently at 43%. Uh, local. Jackie, can I, Jackie, this is um, Commissioner Cameron. Can I stop you there? When you say you continue to work on it, um, yep. can, can you, do you have an example of efforts to improve in that area? Yes, yeah, so but what we're doing right now is as we go through applications that we have for current job openings, um, we're, looking, uh, we're looking more closely at the women who've applied for those jobs. We're also uh, sending our recruitment teams to continue, we're asking our recruitment teams to continue partnering with um, some of the local organizations that have been very helpful in terms of feeding women, uh, women to us in the recruiting channels. Okay, thank you. Jackie, this is Commissioner Stebbins. Just a, a quick follow-up question as it relates to uh, uh, the bartenders that were in transition, has everybody's situation been resolved? Everybody's situation has been resolved. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. On the local hire, we had a goal of 75% and we are at 87%. Uh, percent. Moving forward to supervisors and above, so we broke it out, uh, not just our employees, but uh, one of the things that we're very focused on is making sure that we have representation um, at the higher levels of the company employees um, as well as the general population. So again there, um, we had a goal of 40% for minority and we're at 52. Uh, our veterans, we have a goal of 3% and we're at 5%. Uh, women, uh, we're at, our goal was 50% and we're at 40%. So we've got a 10% a deficit on that which we which we're striving to make up. Excellent job with uh, minorities in supervisory positions. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to marketing and entertainment updates. Uh, these are some examples of the uh, public promotions that we had in October, November, and December. 
Uh, we continue to have an extremely robust uh, schedule of promotions. We've uh, continuing in, into the new year. We've had, we've had uh, we've sort of changed it up a little bit, um, and we're finding that um, we're able to uh, bring in a ton of people on our promotional days. We've had people lined lined up around the casino to pick up a copper pot. Mm. So. Moving into the marketing and entertainment updates, we've had uh, a few events over the fourth quarter. We had the B-52s who performed at our Halloween bash, and we had a sold-out performance of Straight No Chaser in December. Um, on our New Year's Eve party, we had a, uh, it was an invited event. It was an incredible event. Um, I think people really are looking forward to coming back for 2021. Uh, on the next slide, we, uh, we wanted to show you our brand new food truck that has been uh, set up on the casino floor. The uh, food truck has been a huge success. Um, a lot of our patrons really like the, uh, the pricing and the offerings, and they can get in and out of eating uh, fairly quickly. So that's right in the middle of our slot banks and uh, really has done very well. Uh, as previously discussed, we rolled out a new tiered uh, card program. So uh, now we have um, differences uh, which, which, match, which match the market. Uh, we found this has been hugely successful in, in promoting um, our card program. On a community impact. Jackie, before uh, we continue. Sure. I, I, um, you you mentioned the copper pot, and uh, yeah. that actually was a very uh, strategic uh, decision to do the free offerings. Um, the history dictates that that can catch the attention of of our guests. Besides the copper pot, is there another prize that was a winner? Uh, the cars are always a great uh, promotion. People love coming to those. Uh, that was fun. Okay. And, yeah, the toaster oven, strangely, I, were, a, I, <laughs> were I, a huge hit, too. I was going to mention that I was at the casino uh, when they were giving away toaster ovens. And it, it's remarkable. Every other person had one or two. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were holding it for whomever else was not there. And... Um, it, it was really something to see, just the amount of, um, of people at 11 a.m., um, you know, toaster. with a toaster oven. Yeah, and when we ran out of the toaster ovens, it was uh, quite disappointing to a lot of people. So. Well, uh, we appreciate the, all the strategies, and I also appreciated the, the uh, nice coverage that the food truck got uh, in the media. And we have another food truck that um, just arrived. So um, we're going to be rolling that one out soon as well. What is the um, food of choice for that second truck? That's the secret so far. Oh, okay. Okay. Stay tuned, to Commissioner be, Cameron. To be Stay announced. Tuned. Okay, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you for uh, that. Sure. And on the uh, community impact update, we uh, continue to uh, promote volunteerism, and our employees did a fantastic job uh, in the fourth quarter, we did a City Thon 5K. Uh, we did another promotion, which was Pie in the Sky, where we uh, cooked and delivered uh, pies. Then we did a Thanksgiving meal preparation. And one of the biggest uh, events that we had, um, and if you, if you move forward to the uh, packed 83,000 meals for local food banks, this was an event that we did in December 3rd. And we did this in conjunction with our um, properties in Las Vegas as well as Macau. So it was a, it was a uh, event called Feed the Funnel. And our employees, it, it was a great event. We all ran about packing up um, packages for uh, 83,000 meals for local food banks. In December, we did a uh, big toy donation. And the last slide just features some of the highlights from uh, 2019, which was 6,625 community service hours, which exceeded our goal for Uncle Boston Harbor, particularly given that we were in an opening period. Uh, we had 83 volunteer events in communities. 
we gave, it's actually it's over $2.5 million to local charitable organizations, and we partnered with 133 local nonprofit organizations. Jackie, this is uh, Commissioner Stebbins. Um, tell me a little bit more about how, when you say you're partnering with a 133 nonprofit organization, what does that involvement include? If you can so give some an of example. it includes uh, funding. Some of it we help them with their events. Uh, some of them we've given them space in the hotel to host events. Uh, others we've donated to uh, silent auctions or auctions that uh, a particular charity may be doing. And some of them are volunteer events. So we've done a lot of on-property volunteer events so people can uh, stop by on their lunch break, um, you know, do a volunteer event for an hour, whether it's uh, writing cards to um, our military personnel or uh, putting together packages to deliver to local hospitals. Um, so those are the kinds of events that we've done and, and partnerships. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jackie, this is Commissioner O'Brien. If I could take you back to the compliance area, the miners on the gaming floor. Sure. Um, first, a request going forward with the quarterlies. If you could break down 18 to 21 compared to under the age of 18 when you're talking about your stats, that would be helpful. Sure. And then um, talk to me about the three-hour, five-minute uh, episode. So that episode, I'm just trying to, in one second, flip back to that slide. Um, let me get you information about that episode in, in particular. Okay, I'm assuming that's why your average is so long that that might have skewed for this quarter? It, exactly, exactly. So I'll, I'll, I'll figure out that particular one and I'll make, I'll, we can add that report to our uh, following report if you'd like. Okay. We can also provide it to you in the interim. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for Jackie? Excellent. Uh, Commissioner uh, Zuniga? No. Looks, no. looks right. No. Right. Thank you. Uh, good luck with all your efforts on behalf of uh, all your mitigation efforts. Thank you. And thank you for your guidance and that to uh, John Ziemba and the entire team there have been really useful in terms of uh, getting all the licensees together to share best practices. And, um, you know, we've learned, we've learned a lot and uh, it's been a valuable uh, asset. And we appreciate all the cooperation from you and, and your fellow licensees here in, in Massachusetts. So thank you. And we expect that that will be a, a continued um, collaboration on a regular cadence. So thank you. Thank you. All set. Thank you, Commissioners. That concludes the report. Thank you, John. Thank you. Useful. Very, very helpful. Moving on now to item number five. Five. Uh, this this Teresa uh, on res uh, responsible gaming and the Game Sense reports. Teresa Fiore. Thank you. Teresa, do we know if people are dialing in from Game Sense? No. Uh, okay. They're not dialing in. They are certainly watching, though. And Mark should be down in a minute. So I can get started. Okay, so um, today we are going to be providing the quarterly report similar to what was presented at the MGM Springfield meeting um, for the Game Sense program at that property. So today these reports cover um, both Encore Boston Harbor and Plain Arch Park Casino. Um, and I encourage any questions throughout, but also any feedback because it'll help us to create a template for future presentations like this. Um, like I've said in the past, we collect tons and tons of data and I'm always trying to figure out how to trim it down. So don't be shy in what you ask for. Um, so these presentations um, are organized around our logic model and within that logic model, which is essentially a roadmap for um, a program, it's something which a lot of public health programs use to guide their work. Um, there are three primary outputs as we see them, um, to reduce gambling related harm, to reduce, uh, to promote positive play and to um, have an RG-enabled casino workforce. So while we have activities that support those different outputs, they are very much intertwined. Um, so you'll see in the presentation, we provide data which supports those three pillars.
Um, I'll take the magic moments and then I'll give you all yeah, the floor. That sounds great. Perfect. Um, another thing that is new to this presentation are what we call magic moments, and that's denoted by a little magic wand. So you'll see that throughout our PowerPoint. Um, and the reason we included those was because we obviously anticipated to have our awesome Game Sense advisors here, and those are the points at which they're going to incorporate those really um, meaningful anecdotes to really contextualize um, and color this data for us. So we'll be um, not delivering those today, but are excited for the Game Sense advisors in the future to come in and provide those. Um, so with that, I will hand it off to Mark, who will be presenting on um, the Encore Boston Harbor Game Sense team. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I wanted to just also give a quick update on Game Sense operations um, and their response to the coronavirus. Uh, Teresa and I have been in very close contact um, multiple times a day uh, this week um, regarding uh, um, program changes that they need to make. Um, the Mass Council on Compulsive Gambling, who operates the Game Sense Information Center, um, has largely followed the same direction that the Commission is giving to our staff. Um, they uh, um, have made clear that, that, um, that if staff uh, feel that they are, are at risk for one reason or another, um, that they would find alternative work environment for them. Um, this is going to have an impact on operations at at least two of the sites. Um, so Game Sense operations at Encore um, largely will not be affected. Um, however, they may divert staff to Plain Ridge Park Casino and MGM. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino um, is expected to reduce the number of hours that they are able to provide the GameSense services. As you know, um, by contract, they're providing GameSense services 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we're looking at adjusting that schedule, and we're working closely with Marlene Warner, um, Chelsea Turner at the council to, to make sure that we can, we can extend it. Uh, at least the, the more peak periods um, at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Uh, they will also be reducing, um, if not eliminating, many of the um, Problem Gambling Awareness Month activities that they had planned both out in the community as well as back at the house. Um, similarly at um, MGM, um, at this point, um, it appears that they will be able to cover the uh, number of hours that they're contracted to do. However, they will be reducing um, or eliminating uh, problem gambling awareness month activities back, back of the house with the casino employees. Um, this is all subject to change. We, we have a standing meeting at this point. Um, uh, I think we're going to talk to them again this afternoon just to get an update both from their end of what they're seeing from, from their staff and concerns they have as well as any updates that we can provide from, from the commission. So. Um, is there any questions about about that? And of course, your team is we're communicating effectively with them, so they understand yeah. safety protocols, and Absolutely. the team feels like they're getting enough good information. Uh, yeah, I believe I believe so. Um, Chelsea Turner, who is their director of responsible gaming, um, has made a point of making sure she has contact with each one of the game sense advisors at each each of the properties. In addition to making sure that she's in very close communication throughout the day um, with the the game sense supervisors at at each of the sites, um, we do appreciate the um, increased cleaning protocol at each of the properties um, and extending that into the game sense information centers. Um, as you know, these the game sense advisors are very uh, patron facing, and so we want to be um, we. We, they are providing a valuable service, and we want to be as, as cautious as we can um, and responsive to, to the coronavirus. Okay. Um, so, Teresa walked you through the uh, kind of the um, the logic model, and there there are three um, impacts that we're hoping from our logic model. One is the RG enabled casino workforce, one is reducing gambling-related harm, and the third is promoting positive play. Um, 
yeah, I need to advance through that. Um, as, as we go through um, each of these presentations, we're going to touch on each one of those. Those are our three goals, positive play, reduce gambling-related harm, and um, casino or RG-enabled casino workforce. At um, Encore Boston Harbor, we have a, a slide clicker. Um, okay, all right. So at Encore Boston Harbor, we have 10 GameSense advisors covering 16 hours a day. Uh, right now, it is, uh, that team is led by Lynn Ho um, and Ray Fluette, who are the GameSense um, super supervisors. Um, the team speaks four languages, English, Cantonese, Mandarin, and Spanish. Um, they bring a wealth of, of experience with them to the casino and um, um, as well as not only in working with the patrons, working with the casino employees, and thinking about how can we improve, improve the program that we have. Um, so again, going back to uh, the three impacts that we are striving for, the RG-enabled uh, casino workforce, um, the GameSense advisors, while they're very uh, frontward facing towards and working with casino patrons, they also recognize the value of working um, with, with the casinos. Um, the GameSense advisors provided 12 uh, casino staff trainings uh, during uh, the month, as well as three gaming agent trainings per month. Um, they've done one voluntary self-exclusion designated agent training, which means that they're training other, others to be able to enroll persons into the voluntary self-exclusion program. Um, reducing gambling-related harm is the second. Um, so GameSense advisors, this is uh, taking a look at six months worth of data. Um, moving forward, we will be looking at quarterly um, updates to the data, but on average, GameSense advisors have over 16,000, almost 17,000 simple interactions per month. Um, that results in, in addition, 1,750 intensive interactions per month. So those are one-on-one -on -one communications with patrons at the casino regarding responsible gaming, re regarding problem gambling. Um, they also average um, 16 voluntary self-exclusions per month. This is the average. We've actually seen a, a significant uptick in the number of voluntary self-exclusions. Um, the GameSense advisors at Encore, actually, I believe at all three properties, but specifically at Encore are doing um, on a monthly basis. Um, we're looking at extending our, our community outreach efforts and when uh, during, uh, in the next, next year, as we've re-procured the GameSense program overall, um, we're looking at ways that we can extend the GameSense program out into the community with, with um, many of the GameSense lessons and educational uh, teachings. Um, recognizing that um, it's important for our GameSense advisors to be there in the casino, but these are also important skills um, and information that can be delivered out in, in the community. So promoting positive play. Um, so positive play is really about um, providing information to players so that um, they don't move down that continuum um, towards at risk and problem gambling. So what are the characteristics of players that are able to gamble for recreation and as a form of, of entertainment? So when I said our game sense advisors bring an enormous um, uh, skill and talent um, to understanding casino games and, and thinking about ways that we can communicate this with patrons, they are largely responsible for coming up with um, many of the educational activities that help players understand the, the myths, conceptions, and mathematics behind gambling, um, many of which I, I simply couldn't sit here and explain to you myself. So, um, they also um, are working on a, a, a new tool, an augmented reality tool. I mentioned this during our uh, last, um, during my program update in, in Springfield. So augmented reality, um, basically it's a, it's a new way of using technology to be able to communicate with, with patrons and um, promote positive play to promote um, responsible gaming tips. Um, it, it's hard to explain, but we will we will certainly be demoing that for you as it as as time moves on. Um, 
and then follow it, finally, Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Um, the GameSense advisors um, have done enormous work. What you see here is a picture of one of our GameSense advisors working back of the house at Encore, um, providing information, creating this RG-enabled workforce. Um, creating an RG-enabled workforce is, is also um, works towards changing uh, a casino culture. The more people, basically, if we are, our GameSense advisors are working with the casino staff, they're creating ambassadors for, for the program. Um, we've seen it, if, if they were here, then I'm sure they would be able to, to explain how um, creating this RG-enabled workforce not only um, elevates the awareness of the importance of responsible gaming for the individual staff members, but it elevates it to a, an organizational level. Um, enabling them to have those types of staff, casino staff to have those types of conversations with GameSense advisors, and GameSense advisors become a resource um, for staff to, to refer patrons to. Um, we have um, branched out, and this year we've developed a relationship or a partnership with the lottery. Um, GameSense advisors have been out to six of their regional, or five, I'm sorry, five of the, the regional offices. We're planning this month to go to all six lottery regional outlets um, twice per month, twice during the month. Um, because of the, the staffing issues, we've, uh, they've made it to five out of the six one time this month. And at this point, we've, um, we're not able to, to commit to that six or that second visit to, to all six of them. Um, and, and certainly, if, if we can't commit to that, we'd be more than interested in continuing to explore partnership opportunities with the lottery to, to fulfill that obligation, um, probably just not in March. And, and the, um, the reason why you can't commit to the second is, is because of just the current situation that we're in. We are going to be short-staffed. Right. Um, right, so uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Certainly, yes. Okay. And to, I just had another question. The back of the house, that picture um, includes Game Sense advisors meeting with uh, Encore Boston Harbor staff. Correct. So really we depend and, and we have the cooperation collaboration with our licensee here to, to really further one of the three goals. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's been, an, it's been an, a, a, across all three properties, um, yeah. Chairwoman. It's been, um, it's been actually touching to see the type of cooperation that, that we, and partnership that we have with, with these sites. The, um, I went back of the house uh, during our last GameSense meeting at Encore Boston Harbor to, to visit the table, and Ed Edgardo, um, who's, who is one of the GameSense advisors who speaks um, Spanish, was running one of the tables and a quiz activity um, with, with Encore Boston Harbor staff. Um, and it's not just the, uh, uh, I think that specifically who he was working with were some of the people that, that were um, working in, in the hotel. Um, and he was speaking Spanish with them. I couldn't understand what, <laughs> what he was saying. But um, it was clear that there was an interest in the Encore Boston Harbor staff um, in what um, information he was providing, um, and, it, and it was clear that, that there is a partnership that exists there. So, so that's, important. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a really busy team at Encore Boston Harbor. Um, one of the slides um, showed exactly what, you know, how many GameSense advisors do we have to Encore Boston Harbor staff? The number is 483 Encore Boston staff for every GameSense advisor we have there. And so while um, it, it, it tells you that um, in order to really create that RG-enabled workforce, they have to work really hard at, at um, being efficient and effective um, in, in, their, in their job. Um, in the, in the coming months or quarters, we'll be glad to provide you with an update on um, how Problem Gambling Awareness Month ended up, um, other areas in which we're doing community outreach. Um, the GameSense advisors 
right now are planning on moving to a 24-7 model rather than 16 hours a day. Um, again, we'll need to take this as, as it comes and evaluate whether or not that's feasible in the, in the coming months, um, whether or not we can implement that based upon the staffing needs at, the, at this point in time. Um, we're working on a positive play project with Dr. Uh, Richard Wood. Um, to begin, I, I would say that if there's one area that I think that our Game Sense program needs to, to really focus on, is, is how do we refine um, this, this concept of positive play. Um, I, I read an article just recently that talked about um, segment, player segmentation. Well, our messaging and information that we put out towards players is very good when we can begin to identify specific um, populations, specific player segments, and tailor those messages, whether they're um, younger players, whether they're poker players, whether they're um, older adults, there's, there's ways in which we can refine um, the type of messaging we do, the type of information that's put out there that will make it all more effective. Um, and play my way um, is, is also an important piece. Um, we're working with MGM um, and Encore right now um, to extend the Play My Way program to those, those two properties. This is no small feat. This is a project that started about two years ago um, in developing Play My Way using their IGT system. Um, I'm working closely with, with Katrina and Scott um, as well as IGT and Encore Boston Harbor and MGM to um, get this rolled out um, later this year. Any questions? Great report. Thank you for your efforts, and um, I think your enthusiasm is probably, um, it, it probably trickles down to, to staff. So yeah. I, I think this is really important. And They're inspiring staff, yes. and, uh, and so it's easy to be excited about, about this work. Mm -hmm. And um, I know they, they look forward to, to coming to see you, and they can communicate this much more effectively. But mm -hmm. um, they really do inspire me and I think inspire our motivation to do this work. Great. And I, I do know that Teresa is very much behind these reports. Uh, so that's an we, understatement. It, <laughs> I, uh, and, and the reports are so clear. So thank you. And we're, we'll look forward to um, seeing these on a quarterly basis. And I know that as you know, the programs become more and more robust, that Encore Boston Harbor, the statistics will become even more pertinent. So we know exactly the work that you're, you're accomplishing and appreciate the, the formatting, Teresa. Thank you. Okay, so introducing the GameSense team um, at Plain Ridge Park Casino. The team there is headed by Charlie Ordilly, um, who was in fact supposed to be here today, but I'm sure he's watching. We'll have notes for me after. Um, it's made up of six advisors, four of whom have um, casino gaming experience, and you'll notice uh, Terrence Murphy's on there, who's actually one of the original GameSense advisors. So he's been with the program quite a while, um, and it's my understanding that he has a core following of players at Plain Ridge Park Casino, so he's a bit of a celebrity. Um, the GameSense Info Center at PPC is located right by the parking garage elevators before you access the floor, and they're operating 16 hours a day, seven days a week at this point. Um, no intention to pilot a 24-hour program there. Um, so supporting um, the logic model um, output of having an RG-enabled casino workforce, currently the GameSense advisors on average offer um, one um, new hire training each month, um, and that's reflective of the amount of new hire trainings that PPC is cover currently offering. Um, so things have slowed down there quite a bit for them. Um, I also want to note that Ray and Amy, um, both of whom are senior GSAs at Encore Boston Harbor and MGM Springfield, started um, their work at PPC and have since spread out. So it was a launching pad for them. Um, at the time, 
this report was submitted, um, we had community outreach coming soon. In fact, there has already been one community presentation done um, in the town of Sharon, um, and I believe that was done by Charlie, our senior GSA, um, and he actually has three scheduled ones in the New Bedford area in June with mm -hmm. senior centers in that area. Um, the next pillar of reducing, uh, reducing gambling-related harm um, <clears throat> can be reflected through um, Game Sense Advisors' interaction with players. So on average, for the six months, which um, Mark already mentioned, um, they meet with 3,241 players um, in those one-way simple communications. Um, more intensive interactions um, on average are 1,503, and they are conducting an average of six voluntary self-exclusion enrollments per month. Um, there will be a particular emphasis on community outreach efforts for veterans as Charlie or Dilly um, is a veteran himself. Um, additionally, something unique that this team is doing is supporting one of our community engaged research projects around the impacts of gambling on seniors in that area. So they are actually um, distributing surveys for those researchers. Um, so it's awesome to have a team to support that work. And the final output of promoting positive play, um, Mark spoke a bit about Play My Way already, and we're all familiar with um, how it functions as a play management tool. I think it's interesting to note that on average, GameSense advisors themselves are enrolling 508 um, players each month. And that's not to say that players can't enroll themselves, so the actual number of enrollments each month is actually quite a bit higher. but. I would say as far as the work that the Game Sense Advisors are putting in, those are a lot of interactions and those can be um, sometimes long. There's a lot of conversation around what the program is and how to actually enroll in it. Um, there have been some hiccups in the Play My Way software at Plain Ridge Park Casino. I know our IT team as well as the IT team at PPC has been working hard to fix those issues um, and we're hoping they are resolved in the next few months. Um, Again, going back to an RG-enabled workforce and reducing gambling-related harm, um, of course, we have Problem Gambling Awareness Month activities at PPC. Um, these include participation in National Gambling Disorder Screening Day, which was held on March 10th. Um, that's something which the Cambridge Health Alliance supports and um, tries to gain momentum behind every year. Um, and we did have special activities planned for Friday the 13th, St. Patrick's Day, and March Madness, but we will see how those are impacted with the current outbreak, so we'll be able to report on all that at the conclusion of this month. Um, so in summary, um, the GameSense team at PPC is just as busy as the other two properties. They're smaller, but they are just as mighty. They have their own unique players there. They have their own unique challenges there, um, and they do an excellent job in rising to the occasion of their roles. Um, so we look forward to actually having them come in and share some of their stories and some of this data in the future. So any questions? Commissioner um, I, I think it's great. Uh, the activities, uh, you know, um, are, are great. I like the format very much of the report. Um, and, and I think as we see the cadence of future reports, it, it'll continue to tell a narrative of the program, which I think is very important. I'm going to uh, suggest that for one future report, we include the actual model, the one pager of, uh, of the the logic model, maybe as an appendix. Sure. Um, it's, it's really represented here through the slides. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to create the impression that the logic model is limited to, to that graphic that by necessity is well summarized. Um, the activities are throughout the presentation. But the one pager is also a really good tool that we, I know the team um, spent a great deal of time thinking about. Yeah. Um, and again, um, just for one future uh, report and as an appendix, um, I think it tells an important part of the story behind, behind, um, uh, behind this report. Um, yeah. so just a suggestion. No, Especially for next week on the Public Health Trust Fund Executive Committee. Right. That, was, that was what triggered. Um, uh, again, we don't need to necessarily um, 
you know, go in detail at that meeting either, but it's an important point of reference that yeah. should be also understood by others. Right. We, we, we've built GameSense on a public health model and um, a logic model as well as a spectrum of prevention are two tools that we use in order to be able to define what the program goals are um, and activities that support those goals. Mm -hmm. Great, great job. Thank you. And we're going to turn, uh, just to go back to uh, uh, Interim Executive Director of Wells. Yes. I think first I just want to thank you both for the reports. And, and to our Game Sense advisors who may be watching, we do wish you were here. Uh, I think all of us, I can speak for all of us, that we are always enriched when we get to see them in person. So we regret the circumstances, but we know that the future will allow plenty of opportunities to see you, and we hope that um, you're able to continue your excellent, excellent work. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Did you. you, before we break from yeah, actually, lunch. Actually, could, could, could we break now, if, if that's all right? Certainly, we can, okay. we can break from, for lunch now and our timing is about for a half an hour. Is that what we're anticipating, Mary Ann? Well, well, just to bring us back to about, we'll do about, return around 120 then. Does that make sense? Okay. Sounds good. Okay. And we'll be here for um, Dr. Lightbound. She'll be all set at that time. Excellent. Thank you. We're good. All set, Austin. Uh, we are reconvening after a, a short lunch break. Uh, public meeting number 291. As we uh, indicated earlier on, uh, matters continue to be fluid. Circumstances related to ongoing public health issues continue to rapidly evolve. An emerging issue has come to the Commission's attention that does demand immediate assessment. Um, <clears throat> our executive staff, leadership, is engaged in discussions with the appropriate stakeholders and officials. Additional information will be forthcoming as soon as more facts are established. With that, uh, it, it makes a practical sense to uh, not address the important issues on the rest of our agenda so that we can free up everybody here that is needed to address this matter. That does not mean that at the appropriate time we will not return to these, um, these matters on the agenda. With that said, I would recommend that we adjourn this, uh, this public meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you, everyone.